when we're studying about Joseph and Yaakov in Bereshis, there is a, a little intermission to hear about Leveret marriage, but also about Yehuda ben Yaakov. We know that Leveret marriage was a form of marriage that is in the Torah, a man required to marry the widow of a brother, a deceased brother with no male heir. The word leveret means husband's brother. And the purpose of the law, the Torah, was to provide an heir for the dead brother, thereby preserving his name and his estate and the promises made to that family and that tribe and that seed of Abraham. The law also was designed to provide for the welfare of the widows. And we get the story of Ruth and Boaz, but before that, we get the story about Yehuda. And this man, Judah, is the fourth son of Yaakov by his wife Leah. And the tribal family founder that became also the messianic line. Genesis 29, 35, Numbers 26, 19 to 21. So Judah was one of the most prominent of the 12 sons of Yaakov. And he saved Joseph's life by suggesting that his brothers sell him rather than kill him. So he was sold as a slave. And then later in Egypt, it was Yehuda who begged Joseph ben Yaakov to detain him, make him the hostage rather than Benjamin. And of course, in an eloquent speech, Judah confessed what he and his brothers had done to Yosef. And shortly thereafter, Yosef identified himself and unveiled his incognito. Genesis 44, 14 to 45, 1. So he was the leader who remained at home. Even though he wasn't the eldest son, he was sent by Yaakov to precede Yaakov to Egypt, Genesis 46, 28. And also, rather than his older brothers, Judah received Jacob's blessing. Genesis 49, 3 to 10. And in that blessing, take note, Yaakov foretold the rise of Judah. Your father's children will bow down before you. The scepter shall not depart from Yehuda until Shiloh comes. Genesis 49, 8. 
Now, this little intermission, uh, when we we're talking about Joseph, and then all of a sudden we shift to Judah and his three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Genesis 38, three to five. Ur and Onan were killed by divine judgment because of their sins. Judah also fathered twin sons by, uh, by Tamar, who was Ur's widow. And he had promised her to his youngest son, Sheila, when he grew up but he was not forthcoming with that promise. So the woman disguised herself as a cult Zona. And uh, there's a word for that, a Kadesha, a cult prostitute. And she was uh, at the crossroads and uh, she wanted a pledge. And the pledges that he gave her saved her life later when it was found that this woman without a husband was pregnant and she was gonna be burned. Notice her Alma is definitely not a married woman. So if she conceives and bears a son and calls his name Emmanuel, and she is not a virgin and it's not a miracle, then according to this passage, her fate would be death like Tamar would have been so this is another argument. And if you look at the Orthodox Jewish Bible, if you look at the introduction, you will see all the arguments that Ha'alma means young unmarried virgin. And in the case of the fate of Tamar, that definition is undergirded. Because if this girl was not a virgin, she would be put to death. I'm talking about the royal Alma in Isaiah chapter seven. Now this pregnancy uh, with the father-in-law and the daughter-in-law Yehuda and Tamar brings forth twin sons and through one of them, we get the great grandfather of David and we get the messianic line that goes all the way to the Ben David. So, I wanted to point out these things and I wanted to uh, not leave that little intermezzo out because it's very important. But then the, the story of Joseph resumes uh, and uh, when you get to chapter 39, Verse one, we are back with Yosef ben Yaakov. Now remember, he's 17 years old now. But when he's 28, some very fascinating things are gonna start happening. 
But the main thing to keep in mind about him is that God is with Yosef and Yaakov. And everywhere he goes, he is blessed. It doesn't matter what uh, reversals occur in his life. The Lord makes everything prosper to the point where the people he's working for turn over everything to him. Wow, since you're doing so well and God is with you, and everything your hands touch prospers. What am I doing running the show here? I'm going to turn it over to you, and I won't know what's going on, but I'll trust you. And that happens whether you're talking about Potiphar, who purchased him as a slave, or the man that was running the jail, where Joseph showed up, or even Pharaoh himself. And this great savior, savior of the world, the Adon Kol Haaretz, Yosef and Yaakov, wherever his hand goes, the Lord makes him prosper. And there's almost an idea there in Isaiah 53, when Hashem sees the travail of his nephesh, he is satisfied. And then it says, and the will of Hashem prospers in his hand. So, this Yosef ben Yaakov is a type, a foreshadow of Moshiach. And when Moshiach comes and makes the Kippura and has his days prolonged, even in the Kever, meaning resurrection, and Hashem is satisfied that justice has been served and that therefore my righteous servant can justify many. When all that happens, the will of the Lord prospers like with Joseph. Prospers like with Joseph with Potiphar, like with Joseph in the uh, jail or the imprisonment with the ruler of the jail, the man in charge of the jail. or like uh, with Potiphar, with Pharaoh himself. Wherever Joseph is, the will of the Lord prospers in his hands. And the Moshiach, when he makes the, Kor the Korban Kapora, God makes it prosper in his hands. And that word is there in Isaiah 53. And Hashem was with him. And he was an Ish Matzliach, a man of God that God makes prosper. Chapter 39, verse 2 of Bereshus. Now, I want to tell you something. I want to give you a little secret. When you give your life to the Lord, he makes it prosper. You say, oh, I don't know about that. I know a lot of people who've given their life to the Lord and they haven't prospered. As a matter of fact, it, you might say it was their financial undoing to do such a thing. Whereas we know many mafiosa, many wicked people who make millions or even billions of dollars. And, you know, they, they aren't uh, at all in the will of God. 
and yet they're prospering. I'm not talking about a carnal situation. When Yosef bin Yaakov was running out of Potiphar's house and his wife had his cloak and was making up a scheme to lie that this slave that you brought in here, hubby, has made a mockery of us. Because look what he tried to do. But, you know, I cried out, even though there were no men in the house, I cried out and he got scared and he ran out. And now what are you going to do about it? Since you've already made the mistake of bringing him in here and making a laughing stock out of us by doing so, what are you going to do now? You wouldn't say that Joseph running out of the house without his coat was financially well off. You wouldn't say in a carnal way that it pays to serve the Lord as far as he was concerned. But if you look at the trajectory of his life, you see he is blessed and God is with him and everything that he is doing it's under the blessing of almighty God and you wouldn't say that of Ur or Onan whom God struck dead And so, if you look at the life of Yehuda and his three sons, two of those sons did not have what I'm talking about. But Yosef ben Yaakov had what I'm talking about, which is that he was an Ish Matzliach. A man God makes prosper. And he goes all the way to the right hand of God. Through dungeons and, and pits and jails and many trials and tribulations. Yes, but the trajectory of his life is upward. And if you are a believer, that is true of you. Now, someone might say, well, look, Phil, I come into your apartment here. The place is a disaster. You don't have any money. you got all this translation stuff all over the place. And uh, you don't have any money in the bank, really. I mean, not, not, that, not that would uh, make any difference. And uh, how can you say that going from the Wishing Well Motel with 23 cents in 1978 uh, and then coming to the point you are right now in 2023, that you've got some kind of Joseph upward trajectory, that you are an Ish Matzliach, a man God makes prosper. Well, I would consider myself the richest person in the world because I have the most important possession in the world. You say, what is that? I have the Yiddish Tanakh. I'm talking about Shmuel Mortimer Bergman of the British and Foreign Bible Society. I'm talking about an updated version of his work and Aaron Krillenbaum's Brit Shah. And these are being edited and prepared to go all over the world by the United Bible Society software engineers 
uh, translation consultants and uh, other uh, people in several continents and countries who are working on this. And the final frontier of Jewish evangelism is the Hasidim and the Haredim. And I had their Bible. Now, if that isn't being prospered by God, you tell me what would be. Because the flower falls, the grass withers, but the word of the Lord endures forever. I don't know why God entrusted me with this, knowing the kind of reprobate I was, I wouldn't have entrusted the guy with such a thing. But for whatever reason he did, he did. And when he gave it to me, he prospered me. And anybody that's in this ministry with me is a multi-billionaire as far as I'm concerned. You may not be able to go to the dentist. You may not have enough money to get a tooth fixed. But I'm not talking about that kind of prosperity. I'm talking about William Tyndale type prosperity. Who was the richest man in England? Was it the king? No, it was William Tyndale. And when they tied him to the stake and set him on fire, and he looked up to heaven and he said, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. The eyes of King James were opened and some of the work, much of the work of Tyndale went into it. And now we have the King James Bible. You tell me a richer man than William Tyndale. So what I'm trying to get across to you is, my dear friend, you're making a very, very big mistake. You have your nose in all these worthless tomes and you're into all this religious falderal or you're running around on, on some kind of dollar and cent thing where, where in the end, the stock market crashes and you lose it all anyway, or it's gambled away by wicked heirs of your estate, or something else happens to it. There was a billionaire who got into a submersible and they possibly pulled out some of the remains of his body today. Where did all that get him? And those rich people that were on the Titanic, when it went down, where did their prosperity go? I'm talking about a prosperity of the soul, that your soul prospers, that you're going to heaven that you know the Lord, that you're serving him, that he is with you, that he is helping you, and all things are working together for good for you. Listen, if Potiphar's wife hadn't pulled that, he wouldn't have gone before Pharaoh because all of these things that seem to be setbacks were actually triggers for the upward trajectory of the man because the Lord was with him no matter what. If you love God, if you're called according to his purpose, God works all things, even bad things, for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. 
So my advice to you, my friend, is come to the Lord. There are many millennials right now. They look of, at their body as if it were a scratch pad. They think it belongs to them. They can do whatever they want to. It's up to them. They go to the tattoo parlor and they tell the tattoo artists what they want because it's their money and it's their, bio, it's their body. They have their pot, they have their drugs, they have their Apple watch, they have their Starbucks card, they have their live-in girlfriend, they have the world on a string and they're sitting on a rainbow, they think. And they have youth, like Madonna, who found out today that her body is riddled with bacteria and she's in the hospital. Sooner or later, we find out that we either are or we are not an ish matzliach. A man of God, uh, a man God makes prosper. A woman God makes prosper. The kind of prosperity I'm talking about only God can make. And he will only do that if you turn to him. Lord, I want to pray right now that someone will turn to the Lord. That they will seek the Lord while he can be found. That they will call upon him while he is near. I thank you, Lord, for your unmerited favor and mercy to sinners like me. And I thank you, Lord, for how you help us, even in our adversities, in our adversities. I thank you, Lord, that your hand is upon us. And we give you all the praise, Lord. And we ask that somehow many thousands and thousands of people will be blessed through our meager efforts. Not for our glory, but for your glory. And may they see that you did it since we had nothing but you, the God who prospers, the Ish Matzliach. Genesis 39, 2. And we'll give you all the praise. And everybody said, Amen.